Well, um, good evening ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to those who are on Zoom to the uh, Manly Warringah Amateur Radio Club's Lectures Night. Uh, tonight we have uh, Roger Marsden, who's going to talk about his grandfather. So, uh, without further ado, I think I'll pass it across to Roger. All right. Thanks, Rod. Move up to the first one. It's got to go up. Oh, it's a... She's a fast lecture. That's it. That's <laughs> 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 amazing. Oh, I'm All right. Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to um, to put this information together. I've done a number of um, powerpoints and. Um, dealing with my grandfather and um, so the material here of the, the photos of and images I've been able to, to, to gather together and a few of them are especially for this um, talk tonight um, and um, the thing about my grandfather really he's, was research, he, above all else in engineering and physics it was his research work that, um, that really drove him along and his major achievement uh, for Australia really was the, um, his contribution to radar during the war. On the first slide here, we, um, I've got there's, there are three valves there on the left hand side. The, the red one is an, a Philips EF50, uh, which is for uh, very high frequency television work. It was made in 1938 by Philips in Eindhoven and um, was very good at detection and amplification and the, um, the British radar people got onto it very quickly and, um, and used it in a, a, as a strip of six in their airborne ra radar. The valve on the left is uh, what they call a VT90, which is built by, uh, made by GEC at Wembley in England in 1939 and was specific, it was the first spe specifically made transmitter valve for radar which had a frequent had a, uh, a wavelength of 1.5 meters which was a 200 megacycle um, wavelength and um, it had some very special techniques for manufacture especially in the the glass to, to metal seal there I think they use gold for that and the, the techniques we also used when um, when uh, GEC in 1940, made the production model of the magnetron in the middle there and all, all three of these items I was actually able to get at the auction the other, this last sat the Saturday week ago which is, um, which is very fortunate from my point of view. But I've also included on the slide another f image there of uh, a magnetron, the anode which is taken out of a microwave oven. Probably the thing which we all remember most I suppose from the war in terms of radar is in our microwave ovens at home. and. Um, you can see there's a certain similarity in the microwave oven ones there. It actually had 12 centimetres and um, have 10 um, uh, resonating cavities, but they, they have two rings there which connect alternate um, cavities there, which is a similar sort of arrangement that the, um, the, mag the, the wartime magnetron had, which uh, called strapping, where they'd have pieces of copper wire which would link alternate um, cavities to, uh, to make the valve stable. Um, just about my grandfather as a general background there, he was born in 1879 in, in Lochinvar in the Hunter Valley and his, his mother, Annie Bush, um, she came from Gresford, which is just up the road, um, not far from Barrington Tops, which I think you, you're aware of from your, your camps recently. And um, her father was the schoolmaster in Gresford and he had originally come from Bristol in England. And, and his father was Hans Franz Madsen, who was a surveyor who had come from Denmark, um, firstly as an able-bodied seaman working on sailing ships and then joined the gold rush at Ballarat and was there for ten, 10 years as a miner and he wanted to get out into something better and was able to get into surveying and came to New South Wales and, um, 
uh, took up a position uh, with the New South Wales Lands Department. Uh, he lived, they lived uh, uh, mainly though at, at, in Queen Street in Newtown, which was close to the university. And he went to pu the public school there at Darlington and Sydney Boys High School in Harris Street before um, going to Sydney University uh, in 1897. And he completely, he concurrently did the, his science and engineering degree, which is the first uh, any student had done that in Australia. And, and um, uh, he, he obtained um, university medals in, for both mathematics and for engineering. So mathematics really was his strength, and, but his physics was extremely good as well. But mathematics was, if you had to put something at the top of the list, you'd say that it was mathematics. Um, He went to, after completing his uh, university ad degrees at Sydney, he went to Adelaide University. He took up a position there as um, lecturer in, in physics and mathematics under um, Professor William Bragg. And um, fairly soon after, he was offered the position of lecturer in electrical engineering there. And, um, and uh, he, he did a tour in 19, at the end of 1902 to um, to England and America to, to study the techniques of um, training in um, engineering in the universities and technical colleges and then um, returned to Adelaide and was working um, in the electrical engineering, setting it up under, he, he arranged all the, 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 the education, the training of the, the students and was totally responsible for equipping the laboratories and um, uh, in 1904, um, he, he wanted to get married and actually come back to Sydney and he applied, but he, he didn't actually get the, I think they thought he was too good, to, he, his experience was too good in Adelaide to take him away. So he actually stayed in Adelaide with Bragg um, from, <clears throat> from 1904 through to the end of 1908 before returning to and doing research work uh, using radioactive materials such as uh, f uh, radium, especially radium, but, and the other radioactive materials as well. Having t and both Bragg uh, and, to and together they they'd taken a strong lead from uh, Ernest Rutherford, in, uh, who was at McGill in um, Canada at the time, and was uh, <coughs> was making a had earned a great reputation for, for new work in, um, in that area with uh, radioactivity. And he, he, in fact, got the Nobel Prize in 1908 for chemistry. He wasn't really a chemist, he was a physicist, but he was happy to take the, the Nobel Prize money for, for chemistry. And, um, and, <clears throat> and um, so my grandfather continued work that he'd started in Adelaide when he returned to Sydney University as electric, lecturer in electrical engineering then in 1909 through to probably middle to the late 1911. And, uh, and, then, and then he just concentrated on his engineering work and it, was, it wasn't until 1927 that he, he started to get back into research work with the formation of CSIR which is the, is the forerunner of CSIRO. And um, he, um, he, he, he'd chosen uh, radio as, as a field in which he could um, uh, see, see opportunities. And um, probably his interest was, was drawn to radio through publications of work in the, in, uh, in the science journals, the, uh, the um, Royal Society journals and uh, Nature and, and uh, journals like that, and um, so that that was re he became involved in, re in research not only with the Radio Research Board but with the um, the National Standards Laboratory. He was interested in both both particular fields um, when the CSI was opened for submissions in uh, 1927. He, um, he was the only person to put up uh, proposals relating to secondary industry um, 
to, to CSI, everything else was primary industry, but the, they, they were happy to go ahead with the radio research board at the time, but deferred on, the, on going ahead with um, the national standards work because I, really they, I think he was lucky to get even his radio research board up on account of the, the, the money involved. But the, um, the, um, the, ma the main figure behind the financing of the radio research board was um, Sir Harry Brown, who was in charge of the PMG, and he was actually funding 70% of the, um, the finance of the radio research board. So I'll just oh that one. So on the next slide here, there's um, a photo on the left of a group which my grandfather is leading there in 1950. This was an organising committee in which my grandfather was president for the, his preparation for the. Um, the ERSI, that's the Union of Radio Science International meeting, which was to be held in Sydney in August 1952. And um, quite a few of the, the key people from radar uh, who worked at the Radio Physics Laboratory during the war are included there. Um, Taffy Bowen's in there for one, and uh, Joe Pawsey da and, and David Martin. George Martin's, Munro rather, is there. And um, on the right hand side, the, there's the cover there of the textbook of radar, which was put together by Radio Physics in 1947. And it was thought that that was the best way of um, compiling all the, the valuable experience which the, um, the Radio Physics Laboratory had put together during the war. And um, the cover there actually shows the lobe, you can faintly see them, but the, the lobes on the, on the cover there are from the, uh, the lightweight air warning radar. That's a um, 1.5 metre radar. Uh, the Madsen building was in the centre there, as it is now now at Sydney University, was originally built in 1939 as the National Standards Labor Laboratory. My grandfather was given special approval by CSIR to, um, by which he was chairman of the organising of the Committee for National Standards for, the, for CSIR. And he was, he, he was um, on an honour area for that and um, he... he um, was given authority to choose a site and actually set it up. He, so he had full reign and he, he arranged a, a site at the City University to build the Standards Laboratory. This is in late 1939. And shortly after the, the work had got underway, the, um, he, as chairman of the Radio Physics Advisory Board handling radar work, uh, he, he arranged that it would it be extended to include um, the radar work there as well, so the the um, the building was virtually doubled in size, and the two organisations they for security purposes they were kept separate, but they, um, they <coughs> he was in charge of both, and there was close cooperation between the two. Um, and uh, national standards were there until I think 1977 and radio physics had moved out I think about 10 years earlier and moved to Epping and, um, and the standards moved to the National Measurements Laboratory in Linfield. Uh, it's currently used I think by geosciences. There's, but the photo of my grandfather um, on the left is in 1909 when he joined the university as, in, as a lecturer in electrical engineering and his father Hans Ma Franzen Madsen is on the, um, the right hand side there. Uh, just briefly there, uh, I think I mentioned some of these aspects already about the university medals there. Uh, on the left, there's a press cutting of an 18-inch uh, reflector telescope, which my great-grandfather, that's Hans Franzen, had made. He was a member of the New South Wales Royal Society, and he presented a paper there on hand polishing of um, glass specula, and um, he actually ground, he ground and polished a, um, an 18-inch uh, mirror and silvered it for a, a telescope he made, which he had in his um, 
in his backyard in Queen Street there and um, it was used in 1896, I think it was, for the observation of the uh, moons of, of Mars, which was, uh, which is quite an early achievement for, um, for astronomy in New South Wales. In 1896, my grandfather, had his, he was at Sydney Boys High School and he, he with his physics um, award there, he, he, was, he had an honours grade pass I don't know if you can see it, but it says it, he, in physics it was elementary mechanics, sound, light and heat. And there's no mention of electricity or, or magnetism in, at that stage, obviously, there. But in a textbook you know, for university purposes a few years later when he was there by Watson, uh, was actually about 30% electricity and magnetism. But, but even so, only, <coughs> as mentioned, as for wireless telegraphy, there was just only one paragraph right at the very end which, which mentioned Marconi's work in, um, in 1901 when he, he achieved that transmission from uh, England across to uh, North America. Um, looking at, going back a little bit in time now, the, the early work on, on radio was um, was done by um, Marconi in Italy and, and others as well. But uh, Marconi um, was putting apparatus together from, from people he knew in Italy. The, on the right hand side there, there's a photo of the equipment of his transmitter, which is the four balls. And, the, and, and in front there is the receiver. This is in 1897 when he was, he was doing a, um, a demonstration for um, transmission of radio waves over, or Hertzian os oscillations, they used to call them in those days rather than radio waves, but he was trying to do a demonstration to show, this is in 1897, to show that radio waves would, would cross over um, the seawater, and he was, uh, had a transmitter in Wales and going across the Bristol Channel to, um, to an island, in, and um, he ran into trouble with the, he couldn't get the thing to work. He had the, on, the, on the Welsh side, the, um, he was on the top of a cliff, a 50 foot cliff with a, with a um, I think it was a 100 foot uh, antenna. And, he, and in desperation, he, he moved the, um, the, the equipment down to the, the base of the cliff, an extra 50 foot and ran a, ran a wire to his aerial and, and lo and behold, if the thing didn't work. So um, Marconi was a little bit lucky with, um, with his aerials, I think, on a couple of occasions. Ernest Rutherford on the left there, that's a photo of him from a talk he did in 1935. He was born in 1871, so he was, um, he was eight years older than my grandfather. And um, he'd come from New Zealand in, in um, 1895. He'd got an 1851 scholarship, and he was only the second choice, actually, to get it, the first person. And, decided he wanted to get married and stay in New Zealand. He couldn't afford to, there wasn't enough money in it. And, um, and uh, Rutherford wanted, yeah, that's, so Rutherford was in a similar sort of a situation. So he's, he's, um, he's he took with him from, um, from New Zealand a, uh, a magnetic detector. He'd done some work in, uh, in physics in New Zealand um, detecting uh, Hertzian oscillations. And he took that with him to, um, to England and um, he was no sooner there at, at Cambridge when um, the, somebody put the proposition to him that there was a, a difficulty with um, lighthouses in fog that they couldn't be seen and, he, and they said, would you have any sort of a solution to the problem? And um, anyway, he organised a, a demonstration using a transmitter and, and his magnetic detector at about a range of half a mile and he received radio waves through six brick walls and on a wavelength of about six or seven metres and um, he, gained, he gained a lot of uh, kudos for that because uh, he was working under J.J. Thompson at the time and um, there was not much money in doing any work on the, uh, on the lighthouse business and the and x-ray work had just come through in late December 1895 as well and J.J. Thompson realising uh, how talented Rutherford was at doing experimental work, he, um, he put him onto x-ray work. And, um, but in 1897, um, 
Rutherford did write up his his experiment that he'd carried out on the on the radio work and um, described in detail all the the aspects, including his magnetic detector, uh, which is a, a big which was a big as a receiver, which is a big improvement on the coherer, which was Marconi was using. It was a very crude sort of basic thing, a little glass tube with some iron filings in it, really, which had to be tapped and reset. So is that guy there tapping? The guy sitting down was. I think I, th I think that's probably what he had to do to to make it work. So the the magnetic co the re receiver included some sort of a wire looping arrangement, which was uh, was uh, was a, a big improvement, and it did it was more stable, and it wasn't it was more sensitive, and it could be put on things like uh, ships. And. Uh, Anyway, so from, from Rutherford's paper, no doubt Marconi got all the details that, that he, he needed to actually build a, build a receiver using Rutherford's principle, which he did. He, he built his own receiver in a cigar box in, um, in 1901. And uh, so uh, Marconi really gained from Rutherford's experience there. Now, the centre picture is, um, is William Bragg, and um, he's noted for his, in terms of radio, was because he was the first Australian to give a public demonstration of the Hertzian waves in uh, July 1897. And in 1898, he, um, he was on a 12 month sabbatical to, to the UK and he, and he visited uh, Marconi's works and, and saw Marconi. And um, he returned. To, to Adelaide, but it wasn't until 1904. He was a, he was an extremely good lecturer and public lecturer, and, and, and showed all sorts of interesting things to the uh, Adelaide public. Um, but it was in 1904 that he, he seriously got into research work, and that uh, which coincided with um, my grandfather actually having not got into Sydney University, uh, embarked on it with research work with him. Uh, the, my grandfather always took a long-term view of where things had come from, looking ahead and where they'd been, who, who, who had done original work. And so I've just included some photos or images here of the early pioneers in electricity. So they're a little bit out of order, but on the far right, there's um, George Ohm from Germany. Next to him is Michael Faraday, um, Volta, um, Heinrich Hertz and Ersted from Denmark and um, James Clark Maxwell in the, the Scottish chap. So there, there was, um, as you can gather, there were people you know, from in all sorts of areas you know, becoming, who'd become involved. At Adelaide University, um, my grandfather's DSC, which he did in 1907, was to do with the ionisation in, in gases after the ionisation ionising agent had been removed, and um, <coughs> that was all laboratory work. But uh, I know it was was to come in um, um, very handy for him in the when he got involved with radio research in looking at the upper atmosphere, the ionising layers there. Um, but on the left-hand side, there's, there's just the, uh, the Adelaide University clip of his uh, report to the, um, a, a brief report. Um, he, d he didn't, um, as far as I'm aware, meet up with Marconi in uh, 1902 when he went over there and Bragg doesn't seem to have made any special point to him to, uh, to follow that particular area up. And he certainly doesn't mention anything about radio in his, in his fairly brief sort of report at the university of what he had found when he'd, when he'd done his tour. Uh, this, the photo in the centre there is a picture of uh, Bragg's laboratory. My grandfather is on the left and, and William Bragg is at, the, is at the rear there. That's in a picture in 1906. And the right hand side there is a, a schematic of the uh, uh, of a um, an experiment my grandfather did using thin metal foils of gold and silver and aluminium and paper uh, using radium as a source of beta particles to fire through them and and, and using an electrometer to um, detect what strengths were at, at various levels he could move the radium he could move the the uh, 
the foils through several different positions uh, with the radium at a, at a base there. And what he'd found was that um, for, the, for the thinnest foils that the, um, the electron was actually only scattered once, which was quite a remarkable thing really, considering that those, um, those thin foils were probably had, a, had thicknesses of something like 100,000 rows of, of atoms. They, they knew quite, quite uh, accurately what uh, dimensions atoms ha actually had. And um, uh, in 1900, and, and Bragg was, this was in 1909, and, and, and William Bragg was quite aware of the details of the experiment, and he'd gone to, to Leeds, having left Adelaide in 1909. They, they both my grandfather and, and Bragg both left the Adelaide University at the end of 1908, and William Bragg went to, to Leeds to be near Rutherford in, in England, who was at Manchester, just up the road, and um, my grandfather had come back to Sydney University, and... Um, uh, Bragg was confident in the results that uh, my grandfather had had and he was explaining this all to Rutherford who, who was considering his own experiments and uh, what, what, what the, the, uh, what the, the exper his unusual results uh, could mean and, um, and in, 19, in March, uh, March the 8th, 1911, Rutherford wrote he, well, firstly, on the 7th, which was a, a Tuesday, he first announced his concept of, or theory of a, the nuclear atom in the, up to the, the, the alternative views being put forward at the time by people like J.J. Thompson that, it, that the, um, the atom was really like a, um, a billiard ball or a plum pudding maybe with a, some sort of a, a mixture of, of, of electrons and... Um, uh, well, they weren't really too sure what what, other, what the other components were, but anyway, Rutherford announced at the um, Manchester Literary and F uh, Philosophical Society his concept of, of a nuclear atom, and it was probably in an appropriate place, the, um, the, the society, because in about 100 years earlier, John Dalton, had, he'd put forward his concept of, of an atom in, for chemistry and... Um, the word atom was something which he'd, he'd coined as being an indivisible unit. And uh, so um, it was quite a, the, the electron which was discovered by J.J. Uh, Thompson in 1896 was a, the first departure from the idea that uh, an atom uh, was not indivisible. And, and Rutherford was now saying that um, his concept of the, an atom was that there would be a, a, a central nucleus and... Uh, um, consisting probably of protons, which were helium nu uh, nuclei, and electrons, which J.J. Thompson had discovered. But the um, the letter is, uh, it, it's, it was typed up the next day It was and it was posted from his house, and I think it was Rutherford's wife. I think she used to do quite a bit of the typing for, for Ernest, or Ernest, as he was known, and... Um, and um, the original of this letter, my grandfather sent back to Cambridge University, I think around 1966. So he thought that was the safest place for it to be. But uh, Rutherford went on in in a couple in two months' time in May of uh, 1911 in a formal paper to, to the Royal Society. He'd, he'd refined his concept quite a bit and, and carried out further experiments, which were really quite famous and. Um, He'd asked him, in the letter, he was asking my grandfather to carry out further work, which he understood from Bragg that my grandfather was doing, which I think, uh, and there's no record of it really exactly what he was trying to do, but um, uh, it seems evident that he was trying to use even thinner foils to um, probably carry out a similar sort of experiment to the one which I was just uh, setting out there. and. Um, uh, unfortunately, whatever whatever the problems were, my grandfather wasn't actually able to um, come up with the anticipated results, and uh, and Bragg was, uh, and Rutherford in in um, Manchester um, with people like Geiger and uh, and an, another chap called Marsden, who had a very similar name to the to the Madsen name, which I think has caused a bit of confusion, really. But anyway, in the the May 1911 paper by Rutherford is a very famous one. It's probably one of the most famous physics papers there is. And um, he actually specifically mentions my grandfather's work in that paper, which is, uh, 
which is uh, which is something I think um, uh, my grandfather was really proud of. He, he he kept in my grandfather kept in contact with Rutherford for for over thirty years. Uh, it later become evident, but in in um, in 1920, Rutherford, uh, he, he was encouraging radio work uh, at, the, at Cambridge. He'd, he'd gone from um, uh, Cambridge as a student, he'd gone to McGill in Canada, then back to Manchester in England, and then after the war, First World War, he took up a position in charge of uh, the Cavendish Laboratory in, um, in Cambridge. And so my grandfather was... Uh, in, con in contact with with him in 1927 to set up a committee, to, uh, a selection committee to choose three people to come out to join the um, the Radio Research Board in Australia. And so uh, he asked Rutherford and Sir Henry, well, Henry Tizard and um, and Appleton, three key people over there to uh, to be this on the selection committee and. Um, during the 1930s, my grandfather was also uh, submitting papers here from from Sydney to um, to Rutherford. To the, he was in, he was running well. He was heavily involved with the Royal Society. He'd been president of the Royal Society, and um, and Rutherford was uh, was quite he was um, quite enthusiastic about sponsoring uh, my grandfather the papers from the Radio Research Board originating in, in Australia to be published in. Um, in the Royal Society uh, uh, Journal. Uh, during the First World War, uh, my grandfather was uh, the, the officer, he was the chief instructor and later the officer in charge of the, um, the engineering camp, which was at, which is on Roseville, not near the Roseville golf course. And, um, the pictures on the left there are, are shots from his house. He lived in Roseville in Wandella Avenue, and um, um, he, he, he had quite a, a big workshop out there. You'd never think that, in looking through his workshop, you'd never really pick him as a radio or radar man, anything like that at all. He had a lot of electrical and bakelite type materials, and uh, uh, he had two lathes, uh, a vertical drill press, and uh, quite a big workbench, and all the other. He was definitely a, uh, uh, a guy who liked to work with his hands. He, he liked. He, showed, he was keen on um, making wooden platters in his retirement, and but he, he didn't uh, have any any radio or radar valves or anything like that. But during the First World War, they organised in the early December 1917. Uh, they organised a big engineering, a great military display uh, in aid of the war chest down at, at the Roseville camp, and and part of that display was um, of uh, wireless equipment, which which was put on which was put on show. And um, the navy during the First World War, they were big users of they, the, the radio, radio had become indispensable for the uh, for the for the navy and. Um, uh, it, it was like for the uh, the Emden instant, instance with uh, HMAS Sydney that that was sort of radio, radio was heavily involved there, and um, the Germans were were using they, their cables had all been cut by the British early on, and the Germans were to get their messages out around the world. They they were using a very powerful radio transmitter from uh, near Berlin, and the signals from there were even be able to pick up being able to be picked up out here in Australia. On the right there, there's a crystal detector, which for, uh, is a, a, a thing, um, uh, an invention by J.G. Balsilli, who organised um, coastal radio stations around Australia, and and uh, and they and the Balsilli and the um, the Marconi ones were somewhat in in um, Competition with each other, but the governments, I think, just combined the two, and 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 uh, the, the that was really the start of AWA when uh, resulting from that. In 1927, my grandfather went to England, and uh, his one of the main purposes was to 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 uh, establish contact with the the British Radio Research Board which had been set up in, the, in 1920 as part of the DSI, that's the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research in England. They, the DSIR was set up there to, 
as, as a result of experience learned uh, about sci the, the scientific effort and compared themselves with what the Germans had done and they realised that they needed to uh, better coordinate all, all aspects of scientific research in England and they set up various research boards and uh, one of them was the Radio Research Board and the first chairman was uh, on the left there, Admiral Sir Henry Jackson. He'd been heavily involved right from the beginning in radio communication of ship to ship in um, in England and um, uh, Robert Watson Watt was doing work on atmospherics. Uh, atmospherics, that's where he, he had a, a direction finder to locate sources of um, uh, from lightning bolts really and uh, he was keen to um, uh, offer support to Australia as well and uh, he, he lent or gave equipment to be taken out to, to Melbourne and Sydney for uh, uh, for radio direct direction finding work. Uh, in the centre there, there that's um, uh, Edward Appleton. He'd become involved at Cambridge in 1920 uh, with Rutherford's encouragement and um, he was a key figure in upper atmosphere work with the various layers. And um, one of the achievements of the, um, the first achievements of the Australian Radio Research Board involved uh, Checking the um, the polarisation of uh, radio waves uh, transmitted from Sydney down to Jarvis Bay, which was um, going against the the magnetic field and, and heading in a southerly direction, which showed a right-handed uh, polarised uh, left hand uh, right-handed rather polarisation, uh, which was the opposite of what t uh, what. Um, Appleton had, had got uh, going from London up to Peterborough and where the, the downward wave, was, the signal was uh, in the same direction as the, the, the Earth's magnetic field. So um, that, that was substantial evidence to confirm uh, Appleton's theory at the time about the, uh, the, what the nature of the upper atmosphere or ionisation layers um, were. Henry Tizard himself, he, he was, he's down at the bottom of the chap with the glasses. He, um, he, was a he was a chemist from Oxford. He'd become involved during the First World War with aeronautics, flying planes. And, uh, and one of the things he, he first did after the war was he realised that, the, the, that uh, um, the quality of fuel was extremely important to the performance of aircraft, especially for the Air Force, and uh, he ran a project uh, with Shell to, um, to, to determine what actually became the octane rating of fuels. But um, he was the secretary of the, the DSIR, and um, he had quite a, he had a, a wide range of uh, very close associates, which, which he built up and, and continued with over many years and became important in the, um, around 1935, where he, he organised uh, some four of his close associates and friends who, who, he'd, who he'd built up experience with to, uh, to look at the problem of, um, of the German bombers, which they, they felt were, were inevitably, you know, would get through. And I'll just come to that, come back onto that one a little bit later, but the, the other chap in the top right hand corner is Jack Ratcliffe who started out at, under Rutherford in around 1920 as well at, at the Cavendish and um, uh, he, was, he was to remain there for many years and um, in fact we led uh, quite a few Australians who went over to Cambridge and, and did PhDs in, in radio work so he, he um, is is an important figure in there in there as well. He, it was he who actually came to Sydney in 1966 as a, for a Rutherford talk and came to Roseville there and my, gran it was, my grandfather gave him the original of that Rutherford letter to take back to Cambridge University. So, um, so that's what he, what he did. I actually met him, I was lucky enough to meet him in, just briefly at lunch in, um, in 1972 and um, and he showed me around a little bit of Cambridge and the Cavendish, well, the front door at least. He couldn't let me in, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next slide is the, the, 
Well, the, with the Australian Radio Research, Research Board, the members were Tom Laby, who's a professor of physics in, at Melbourne University. There was Harry Brown in, the, in charge of the PMG. Um, there was my grandfather and a Commander Creswell from the, the Royal Australian Navy. I think my grandfather would have liked to have got Ernest Fisk from AWA on the board. I'm not too sure why he wasn't, but anyway, AWA uh, remained a close contact of Radio Research Board workers, did the radio stations and the PMG. The PMG, of course, had to do, they, they set down all the rules and regulations of, as, as to what um, broadcasting station uh, Transmitter frequencies should be, and and uh, and and just you know they were the government vehicle for um, setting down policy and and deciding on on how things should work. In these the the pictures here from the left to right, there's a, that's Ernest Fisk. I think you're familiar from a previous talk about Ernest Fisk's work and at AWA. He was a Marconi man, of course, and. Um, uh, next to him is David Martin from Scotland. He, he was um, he was very good at theory, well, a combination of, of skills there. But he uh, he was noted especially for his his knowledge, his uh, upper atmosphere work. George Munro was the next chap. He was selected by um, for a New Zealander and was selected by the. the yeah. Sorry. We been through this one, have we? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, I thought that was. A, yeah. Ah, oh, um, sorry. Yeah, I thought that was Aaron Brown on the second one. Mm. Uh, well, this. Uh, well, anyway, I'm not just reverting back. The Jack Piddington is on. Is in the glasses there. He's he became a key figure in the um, the early w w air warning radar for um, for, uh, for for Darwin. Um, the next slide here is is uh, it shows the, there's my grandfather and Tom Laby in the um, in the middle. There's a, the vague picture, unfortunately, is it's the only one I could ever find of Sir Harry Brown. He lived in Roseville as well. And on the right, there's there's the uh, an ex, uh, a schematic of the uh, ionisation work which was done at the Radio Research Board um, using different layers and a technique. A pulse technique developed by two Americans called Bright and Tuve, uh, and the, the pulse work uh, that that really was the uh, the the mainstay of the um, the experience gained by Radio Research Board, which led into radar in 1939. On the left hand side is an extract from a paper that uh, David Martin and, and Owen Pulley, did, another chap, he did, uh, looking at the temperature at the various layers in the atmosphere from the ground up and. Uh, it was quite a remarkable piece of work at the time, especially as they were using radar, radio means for determining the temperature um, by electron density calculations, which actually, they came up with the right answer, but uh, for the wrong reasons. But the, um, it, was, it was a paper which was, which was looked at over many years and, uh, uh, and which was largely the work of David Martin and um, um, it's it's probably only only the main, the um, in the ozone layer the, where it bulges in the outwards there that uh, that's probably where they got it most wrong. It, they were showing much higher temperatures for the ozone layer than than it's uh, currently known as. Uh, the next slide, my grandfather was, became, after the war here in 1948, he became a director of Phillips and um, he had, he had uh, I think, a very high regard for the, the work of Phillips in, um, in Holland because of their research laboratories and he, he'd, he'd gained knowledge of that work uh, which had been carried out in Indonesia during, um, in the 1930s on um, Tropic proofing it became a critical issue for radio and, and radar equipment during the war to to tropic proof the radar equipment um, which was being sent up to to New Guinea and the Southwest Pacific and uh, it was Phillips who who had actually they were the only ones who'd done any work on it and um, it was a key for the the tropic proofing work was uh, a key feature of uh, what was done in um, and kept a, kept a radar stations operating under well, on extremely wet and humid conditions, but 
the people involved here is going back to the early days of the, the two Phillips brothers who set up the in, 18, in the 1890s. There's Gerard, and who was very good at manufacturing, and his younger brother Anton, who was a good salesperson and good technically as well. And uh, next to him is Fritz Phillips. He was, he was the son of Anton, who became the the chairman of Phillips in 1962 and came out to Australia and my grandfather met him and um, I, think, I think Fritz referred to my grandfather as Uncle John so they, they anyway they got on on good terms but the chap on the right is, is Gillies Holst who is, was taken on board by Phillips in 1914 to do research work and um, he did a pretty fantastic job on, on the research side and getting their laboratories up and uh, they became involved on X-ray tube work, um, uh, better light bulbs, and then the Pentode the, in 1926. And um, Pentodes were really a, became a, a great strength in the valve market for uh, for Philips. That's what made Philips the international force it is today. The patent, the royalties from the patent for Pentode. Oh, right. They still get pendant royalties from that, do they? Or? Not now. But they used to, yeah. No, that was... I don't know how long the, 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 uh, the period lasted for, whether it was 10 or 20 years, but because they'd all be coming for... They'd be developing new ones as well. The, the Air 50 was a pentode, and the, um, this one here, this is the 1926 one, this was their, their first pentode, which um, uh, meant they only had to use one valve, um, I think, in... Um, in a radio set, but the photos here, the Phillips became, they were asked to do x-ray work during the First World War because of the, the German, because of the Germans, they'd been supplying it and the repairs had to be done. And um, so Phillips took up that work and and uh, the picture of the x-ray tube there is there is their first one of their own, which they built. And then they, then they started making in around about the same time uh, uh, radio valves uh, that were Telefunken, I suppose. The I suppose after the war, they just simply took took the, the method and just made them the same as Telefunken had. But uh, in 1926, uh, Gillies Holes came up with these the Phillips pentode, which was um, which is a very powerful valve, and, and uh, the Phillips then realised there was when they looked at the figures for what they could get out of pentodes, selling pentodes, and what could actually be made out of making a completed radio, radio set itself. Uh, told them that they they are very commercial people, and they they went into making radios using the pentode and. Um, the speakers typically at the time were actually separate to the receiver and the, the, in 1930 I think it was the, they came up with this smaller one where the speaker was was the, the cathedral radio where the, the speaker and the receiver were all built into the one one unit and they sold very well I mean in the 1920s and early 1930s they were really boom times for radio the, I mean from 1920 onwards I mean you had RCA in, in, um, in America and uh, you know, they, they were really the gold, the golden years of, of radio range from the early night from about 1920 through to the mid 1950s. So um, it, was, it was a period where um, uh, there was a great deal happening. People were people were um, tuning in, and um, sets were they 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 weren't. Um, I don't know that they're all that expensive, but they they were certainly they were the production method. They're always looking to get into production methods where they could produce in, in large quantities and and keep the price down because there was a lot of competition. In Sydney, these uh, Phillips had a uh, a valve factory on Parramatta Road, but a camper down there that ran from I think about 1935 up till just after the war when Phillips relocated just about all their, their uh, factory works over to uh, uh, Hendon in, in Adelaide. They picked up a, uh, an old arms factory there virtually very cheaply from the government and so they moved it over there. And AWA was um, making valves in Sydney just before Phillips as well. And the Centre Tower is the, is the well-known uh, radio tower in York Street that AWA uh, built there. That was their head office. and. Uh, that was uh, a notable feature there. And in um, 
a few years ago, a, a Spanish chap called Ator Anjuaga, he, he put a, a book together called Wallace and Empire, which was uh, talking about um, the Wallace experience in the British Empire in England, South Africa and Australia, New Zealand and Canada. And he actually gives, uh, he, he's gone to quite a lot of trouble to look, in, look into his story there. It's worth having a look at if you're interested in history of these things. But um, uh, he does give a, a quite a comprehensive account of the work of the uh, Radio Research Board and my grandfather's role in it. During the 1930s, uh, in radio astronomy, uh, Carl Jansky, uh, he, he, he detected radio waves coming from, from, the, um, from the outer atmosphere, from, from the Milky Way, basically. So that it, nothing, it didn't really take off until after the war radio astronomy, but he, he was virtually the first person to, um, to get evidence that there were radio waves coming from you know, very distant sources. The EF-50 there, I mentioned right at the very beginning, that was a Philips one in Eindhoven. Um, there's a very interesting story about um, how it was um, um, obtained out of Eindhoven at the very last minute as the Germans were invading in, in May 1940. And uh, in England, they, uh, they thought that the, 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 the mini, what, the EF-50 was actually being made by Philips, which was in England, but in fact, it was being made in Eindhoven and there was no factory in England for, to, which was making it. And, and so it was, a, it was a very rushed sort of job. The, they, the, the uh, Watson Watt, I think, was the key figure pushing for it. You know, they, they got a big order, as many as they could possibly get out of Eindhoven and they're running in the factory 24 hours a day for, I think, about two months. And, and produced several hundred thousand um, glass cases and, and bases for the Air 50 and they were to also asked to provide the equipment to make the, uh, especially the glass base. And uh, they loaded it up onto a truck and got it out on the last ferry out of, out of Holland to England uh, uh, as, the, as the Germans were attacking. On the top quarter there, my grandfather flew in, in uh, Pan Am Boeing 314s on, on several trips. And this is the, the, um, the, the cockpit and the, of the navigator and the engineers and the radio oper operator you can see in there on a Boeing 314. Um, they were using... Um, uh, Okay, there's a, a slide which will come a little later, which will give some idea how they did it across the Pacific. But um, they, Boeing realised that uh, went on their Trans-Pacific route, their, their first route was from San Francisco to um, to Honolulu, then to um, across to the Philippines, and uh, with stops at Midway and. Uh, and two other stops, and so there are huge distances across, you know, ocean, ocean, and they, had, unless they had a reliable uh, navigation system, they were, they were certain to get lost. And um, um, a chap called Luteritz, who seems to be the the key figure in designing and organising um, the the uh, the radio navigation system for the for Boeing. On the this slide, on the picture below, that's the um, the C class, the quarter C, C class fly, Empire flying boat, which my grandfather flew to England in uh, de late December 1939 and back. He had to he had to urgently go to uh, to London to speak to Watson Watt because there was a security issue and they and they needed to sort of get updated since the the war had uh, got underway and. and um, so it, it involved one uh, well, these flying boats. In, uh, that was quite an adventure, really, to, to involve ten stops to get from Sydney through to London. And uh, from a radio point of view, you can barely see it, but there was a, there was a, an out, outside antenna which uh, stretched from um, the front through to the the fin at the back. And um, yeah, the tail. They seem to be. I think they used uh, they used a different ra radio navigation system to to Boeing, and they uh, uh, it involved sort of switching from from left to right to, to sort of get the get a get a signal which they could home in. It was more of a it was a homing system rather than a, um, a system of going by bearing. Uh, 
so just going back to the start of, of, of radar in, in England, which was in, from 1935, the, um, it was Henry Tizier who we were referring to earlier who organised the committee of, um, of himself and four of his close, close uh, associates, um, including on the, on, the, on the top quarter there is um, Harry Wimper Wimperus, who was um, a good friend of Ernest Rutherford's and um, he was invited to come to Australia in 1937 to advise the government on how it should set up an aircraft industry and uh, um, Rutherford actually in a reply to a, uh, another letter was, told my grandfather that Wimpress was coming and that it gave him some idea that it, he was involved on, on uh, defence work so it was something of a tip off from Rutherford to my grandfather that uh, he should, he should just suss this out and um, anyway, Wimperus and my grandfather met in Melbourne in a hotel room and, and Wimperus did ask, you, did my grandfather have any idea what might be going on and uh, my grandfather told him he thought that radio was being used for, uh, for detection work and uh, Wimperus was pretty, was um, really taken quite aback with this because it was all supposed to be very secret but the other, the other member, uh, the a chap called Patrick Blackett. He's on the on the bottom left-hand corner. He was he was a, a key a mathematician type uh, person who who became um, heavily involved in the operational techniques of operations research during the war. And he's he was involved in the um, the uh, organising of, of using radio, radio equipment into an organised. Uh, operational system to, to make the thing actually work. But the actual t first experiment that um, was carried out to see whether uh, radar was even feasible was based on a suggestion from um, Watts and Watt to the to Henry Tizard and the Tizard committee using a, a BBC um, transmitter called the uh, Daventry and uh, there was a an old, an old bomber and a little radio, uh, mobile radio sh uh, shack, I suppose you'd call it. There was, was set up, and the um, they they actually did get a detection from uh, from the experiment, and that sort of le that led them on their way to um, to building the uh, chain home system, which is on the the top. You can see there the three transmitter towers on the left and four receiver towers on the right, and. Um, they were using wavelengths for the chain home system of, um, of about, tw I think it was 12 metres. It started out as something much longer than that and then they, they brought it right down to 12 to be, to be given, um, to give them the most flexibility and the, the equipment that they used, they, they wanted in building the, the radar equipment, they wanted to use whatever was commercially available either by the PMG or, or um, the BBC or the radio stations, they didn't really want to get heavily into research and, and building new and tying themselves to, to waiting for new equipment. They wanted to run with what they had and make the best use of it. And uh, um, that, so the, the valves and, the, and all, all that, that, that was, they, got, they tried to get as much as they, they possibly could from what was available. Uh, Philip Zuber, the picture of the the the, Af the, the raft chappy there is Sir Philip Zuber de la Ferti. He he um, he was on special art at radio RDF as they called it in those days, radio direction finding, or became radar. But the he was on he was on that special RDF duties in uh, late 1939 40, and uh, when my grandfather and Watson what got it got together, they worked up a new plan as to how, what Australia and New Zealand uh, would be doing in cooperation with, with Britain and how it will all work. The, um, the recommendations went to uh, Sir Philip Zubert and, um, and then on to the Secretary of State for Air. In the early day, Taffy Bowen, he, was, he came to Australia in, in early, early 1944, I think it was, uh, after he'd been in America, he he was spent a lot of he was heavily involved right at the beginning with uh, Watts and Watt and then airborne radars uh, from 1935 onwards, and then went to uh, America in um, August 1940 with the Tizard Commission mission, and um, 
he, he, he took the magnetron there and, and was heavily involved in making suggestions as to what type of equipment uh, the magnetron could be best used for that the, the British were after. And also he, the ASV Mark II airborne radar, which was his, his real uh, starting point using the, um, the, the 1.5 metre uh, wavelength. That all came, the 1.35 metre all came about because he started to use uh, television shows he's, because they were small and, and that was available again and uh, they could put that into an aeroplane and, um, and they did some trials and found that uh, 1.5 metre was, um, was an ideal wavelength to run with and, um, and that became, the ASV became, it was a standardised set and in Australia, the, the two main wavelengths which were used here were the 1.5 and, uh, and the 10 centimetre. Anyway, uh, Taffy Byron uh, became chief of the, the radio physics division and from 1944, 45 onwards, and uh, he wrote a book up called Radar Days, which is, which is a, a very informative book about all, all, these, all this um, work that was going on and uh, uh, he of course became heavily, heavily involved with the, the Parkes radio telescope. That was very much his, his idea and, and, and an effort there uh, as well. With the Battle of Britain, the, um, the main technique and it's, a, it's it's, it's a very it's, it's a very involved system there, involving radio radar detection, passing signals via uh, telephone lines to um, it was Bentley Pryor. Bentley Pryor was a, a filter room where they they'd gather all the information from radio, from radar and observer core, and and the various they had a number of sectors and in the filter room they they'd plot. Uh, with markers, what the uh, the information was uh, put, uh, collated together, which would show um, the, the the size of the the German um, attacking force and and um, what what which sector the uh, the the defence had to be passed on to. So. Bentley Pryor was a filter room, and then the the picture on the left was Uxbridge, which was Group 11. That was the um, that's where they they had the plotting another plotting table there, which in, in a in a room, which is now a museum in London. If you if you get to London, you can go to the um, Battle of Britain Museum, which is the Uxbridge um, site there, and. It's like it's um, it's all the information that you could you, that was needed to organise the uh, defence in that particular sector. Um, in Group Eleven included Big and Hills, and um, there were there's some I think uh, oh, must have been five or six other aerodromes in in the Group Eleven, which was the main defence sector for um, for London. And the um, the little the marker boards the lump marker pieces were moved across the plotting board there, and they'd show the um, on the on the tote board at the back. It would show the um, the, the squadrons which were, were available, and on the uh, what in what status they were at. And on the on the plotting board, it would show little markers, and it would show in that particular area the uh, the um, the squadrons which were up. Um, and the the height in thousands of feet, and then the number of um, German aircraft at the bottom. So um, then they'd, they'd, then there'd be operators who'd be watching this, and then they'd be in contact with the the airfields, you know, telling which squadrons to go up or passing information as to where they were relative to the the Germans, etc. But the um, it was it was Hugh Dowding. He he became involved with radar right from the beginning, and, and in this process of working out the Biggin Hill experiment, as it was known, and there was a group of five, five RA, well, 
I think there were, there were three RAF chaps and two civilians in a, in a group who did all the organising for actually working out precisely how this, all this system you know, um, had to work. And, um, and the, um, there was, it, it, it involved really preserving squadrons as carefully as possible so that the, uh, you know, so that the, there was always some sort of reserve in case, you know, the Germans mounted a more, a more determined attack and there was no telling exactly how they were going to go about it, but the, um, Anyway, so Hugh Dowding did a, a very good job and he came under a lot of criticism by other squadrons who wanted to have these big wings and, and get up there and sort of hammer away. But the, uh, he stuck to his guns and, in, and of course in the end um, things, that, it, it wasn't radar entirely which actually won the Battle of Britain. Things like the, uh, the octane rating which Tizard was, had been involved with, they, they went to hop, 100 octane uh, fuel um, in about May, only a few months before the Battle of Britain, and the um, and the Rotol constant speed propeller. That was another major factor, which was only introduced virtually literally days before the Battle of Britain got underway, and increased the, between the octane rating and the and the uh, the uh, constant speed propeller with the Hurricanes and the Spitfires. They um, it improved their performance enormously and, and, and contributed a great deal to the to the final result, which, uh, well, everyone knows what what the outcome was. And the the uh, ten centimetre magnetron that was the the navy was responsible. The navy has a lot of uh, quite a significant role in all of, all of this radio work, and the uh, you know the. The picture of the, all that complicated gear on there is a reenactment by the BBC of the of Philip um, of um, Mark Oliphant's um, laboratory, where Randall and Boot, they were the two research workers, physicists, which who were working under under Apple, under um, Oliphant, and they they gave the uh, the um, I suppose you'd call it the prototype, the bench type one, which was produced on the uh, and the, on the laboratory there, and they're, they're actually amazed that it, it was producing so much power, and, and it was actually at the right wavelength of 10 centimetres. But the the magnetron uh, shown there is the one which was um, taken to America and Canada in um, in August 1940, and it's now in the museum in Ottawa. But the uh, it was it was GEC at Wembley, which um, made it into a uh, a very efficient uh, production item, and um, it had a number of special features, especially on the uh, the cathode, which was uh, oxide had oxide coating, uh, which was a French idea, and um, there was the strapping, which they with the wire was put through on alternative cavities, resonant cavities, but. Uh, yeah, no, the Americans were absolutely amazed. They didn't have anything like this at all. But in just considering who else might have had it, the, the Germans knew of the magnetron as early as 1936 at Telefunken, but didn't go with it. Um, and the, the Japanese had a, a similar magnetron as well, under the, which they developed in 1939. And again, they had different ideas about radar and uh, they were more interested in night fighting and, and having their own ideas methods there and um, using binoculars and uh, it wasn't in the case of the Japanese it wasn't until um, Guadalcanal you know, came to a conclusion in what early 1943 when the Japanese finally realized they'd lost out to the the United States Navy who was using uh, radar at night time and um, then the Japanese started to uh, to use radar, they had they had the gear there. They had to get into production, and but it was it was all too late for them really. But down the bottom, there's there's three three there together. The left is this is a picture much later in 1957, but it shows the three key Australians anyway involved with uh, 10 centimetre work. Well, there's Mark Oliphant on the right with the grey hair, um, Fred White uh, who did a lot of work in um, in in um, 
trying to get the British and the Americans involved with equipment which was suitable for the, uh, in a lightweight sense, for the, for the um, Southwest Pacific and my grandfather there. And um, in the bottom right hand corner there's Taffy Bowen is showing two scientists at the MIT, that's the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They, they became the, the key, one of the key places in America for radio radar, the Rad Lab they call it, the MIT, but the, um, um, in England they had the TRE, which is the Telecommunications Research Establishment, but after the war, uh, MIT and TRE, they, most of their people I think went back to their universities or what have you and never really continued on, but in Australia the, um, the radio physics, it, it remained as a group, as a substantial group, uh, and, and looked to see what sort of things it could do and, and came up with quite a few different ideas and things. And, uh, and uh, so it, Australia was really, it was different in that way. Uh, going back to the 1.5 metre radar, the, the VT90 valve is, is shown there. The, it was made in America and in, here in Australia and um, it, um, it was really the, the backbone of, of the, of the 1.5 metre radar, but there was, a, except for a period of six months from February 1942 until about August 1942, when they just couldn't get either completed units from overseas or didn't have all the raw materials, especially, I think, thoriated tungsten uh, to make them here. But anyway, they had to use another valve from America, an EMAC, which was apparently readily available, but it involved redesigning a fair bit, a certain amount of the uh, the radar equipment to do it, but they, it was less powerful, but they, anyway, they, they had something that they could continue with until um, they got back on track around about August or September of 1942, and then, and then they were, uh, and they were pretty right, but the, um, the aerials for the 1.5 metre radar were made by the New South Wales Government Railway, and on the right there, there's, there's a range of, um, of five different sets, different type for the Navy and for the RAAF. They, they were made into a lightweight fashion. A um, chap called Wallage out there did a very good job on that and they were known as Wallage aerial, aerials. But with radar, the um, a vital component was to have a, a, a feature for IFF uh, identification friend or foe because um, if you're looking at a signal, it becomes quite difficult to actually you know, determine you know, what you should do if they couldn't tell the difference between your own, your own aircraft and, and enemy aircraft. And um, so the IFF uh, Mark III, I think it was, it came into operation around 1943 and, uh, and then that, that seemed, seemed to work very, quite well there. And, um, I do, and I, do, I think that the Japanese may have twigged to it and uh, been able to give out false uh, IFF friendly readings. And, and uh, anyway, the, um, the Japanese were expected to go into uh, radar defensive uh, jamming methods and, and, and use techniques um, similar to, to what the, the Germans had been doing towards the end of the war in the later stages. but. Um, it, it really never transpired with the with the Japanese. The, um, the work in Australia was was to uh, to make magnetrons of shorter wavelengths down to, to uh, well the Americans were were pushing down to three centimeters and and they were certainly heavy into to that which would which would give them flexibilities of switching from one one frequency to another if if they, they were becoming jammed and I think the Australian one was actually to go slightly higher than the 10 centimetres. There was no point in Australia sort of duplicating what was going on in America. But um, the the lightweight aerial uh, air warning set and the ASV Mark II. The the ASV Mark II is shown on the on the bottom there and. Um, the, uh, a lot of the componentry from the ASV Mark ASV sets was actually used in the the Australian lightweight air warning set, which is in this one is the next one. The 
The, uh, the picture on the left shows uh, how it would look with the uh, IFF antenna, like a seat or a, a, sitting at the top there, and it was just it was in a uh, just covered by a waterproof canvas tent. And in the Australian War Memorial, there's, there's a photo there, or they've got a, a lightweight set um, which you can see there. The it's, it was designed on a, to sit on a rotating table, which was driven by a hand wheel, so that the whole uh, the, the pair of cabinets for the uh, transmitter and the receiver, the transmitter on the left and the receiver on the right with a small uh, cathode road tube there to, to, to observe. So uh, there were something like 200 sets produced. The Australians used over 100 and I think the American signals, they had a similar order as well. So it's a little bit hard to know precisely what the, the Americans did with it. but. The Americans didn't have anything which was uh, uh, which could do the same job, and um, uh, I think from the American point of view, they um, they, they they didn't uh, didn't know really how how it came about. They just knew that somehow or other their signals boss somehow managed to get this uh, equipment, which was lightweight and can be moved to forward positions and. Uh, and that they didn't have it, but they were very thankful for for what they did. They were able to get. It, um, it certainly became a rule or any any operation up in the New Guinea area there that uh, no operation was to be was to get underway until there was forward uh, radar radar in position, and um, and it and it worked very well. Um, on the right hand side there you can see a landing craft, an LST that the Americans had, or two of them there, and they've actually improvised and put, a, put some of their uh, lightweight air warning sets as, uh, to make them um, uh, usable and, well, wherever they wanted them to go actually. They could, the, most of the Australian ones were, were certainly in forward positions, but uh, by putting radar on, on LSTs, they they, uh, they could be used as radar pickets, and uh, uh, as I say, those, those photos came from a chap called Trent Talenko, who's the uh, who I've got to know. He's in the Defence Management Services or Contracts uh, body over in America, and um, he, he he's written up and, and especially looked into the role of uh, radar in MacArthur's area and. Um, and the signals use that uh, uh, that he had. So, with with um, with the radio research board, what happened? The key people from the 1930s in the RIB went across to the radio physics laboratory, and we're operating at Sydney University there. But the, there was one area of work which the RIB can, continued on with which was the ionospheric spheric prediction service and um, and the um, the key role of, of that was is, was to allow radio transmissions at, at, an, at the correct frequencies at any time during the day and uh, 24 at 24 7 up to three months in advance and uh, um, MacArthur ended up. He had he had a uh, when he was in Brisbane. He had a transmitter and a receiver station there, which was using uh, IPS frequencies, which he can he could actually speak directly to East Coast America from from Brisbane there, which was which was quite a fantastic benefit for him because he, he could keep in contact with the the receiving. There's a receiving station here using rhombic antennas at uh, Capital Arbor and. Uh, and Laurie Murray, a chap I know, he's a, he's a ham radio chap, he's very helpful and he's put a lot of work into writing up the story of, um, of, of this work in, uh, in Queensland and the, the, by the end of the 1944 there were quite a few stations around the, the globe, or allied stations, which were, had uh, recorders and were organised in this IPS work and um, and it, it was a, a, vi a very vital function. And after the war, my grandfather had it moved out of the radio research board, which is research work into a, a, a production environment. So the, the government took it over and set up a service. And, and it runs today. You're probably aware of it. So it's, it all it all comes back to those early days. On the left hand side, there there's um, 
a photo of Fred White on the, he's got glasses and a chair and Dr. Carl Compton, he was the president of MIT. This is a photo from in January 1944. What had happened was that the um, uh, in America, in, by getting towards the end of 1943, they they felt that they were, they were getting pretty well on top of the radar requirements for the European theatre and uh, thought it was time that they should come down to the, the uh, South West Pacific to see what they could do down here. And um, so Carl Compton came down and uh, he's, he was an extremely high level uh, chappie to, to take up that task. And so he, my grandfather spoke to him in terms of uh, operations research, uh, what work was going on there, and Fred White especially was explaining the uh, various types of radar which Australia had in the, following the lightweight principle, which was not only the air warning, but there was the GCI set, which is the ground control intercept set, which was uh, another key piece of equipment. and. Um, Anyway, it was decided, I think, a, a team of about, I don't know whether it was five or eight, a relatively small team was then organised to come down from MIT and, and two commercial operations to, to, uh, to be located with uh, radio physics in Sydney to, um, to look into what could be done. But um, as I say, the things didn't really unfold with the Japanese the way they had, in, had with Germany and... Um, and so it was. It was a nice. It was a good thing to do, but there was, it didn't really. Uh, the effort didn't really require a great deal to uh, to pick up on. Most of it had been done by radio physics anyway. Uh, during the during the war, the the Battle of the Atlantic with the U-boats, of course, was a um, was something there that was was that's almost devastating and nearly put Britain out of the war. But the, from a radar point of view, the, um, or radio in general, the, the radio became a key component of, of how the, the Germans were actually finally defeated in May 1943. They lost 50 U-boats in, in, in that month when all the ta tactics that the, that the Allies had all came together and, and caused that loss on them. And the U-boats, they lost another 50 U-boats in June trying to get home. and. Uh, so that that was the final deciding point. But the one of the, from the radar point of view, the the long range liberator was was a key element, it, and um, in the the very first ones would have come had the uh, had the ASV Mark II, and later they had the a microwave, a ten centimetre microwave uh, version. But the the long range liberator uh, allowed the um, coastal command to to do much greater distances and uh, Philip Joubert, Philip Delaferti, he was heavily involved that uh, but he he was moved on uh, he was moved on uh, shortly before May 1943 so he really didn't quite see the um, the, the results of it, the final result of his efforts but uh, for the navy they had the um, uh, what was called Huff Duff, the, the detection of uh, the German um, submarine radio signals, they, the, the Huff Duff radio receiver there, it, it, it was very, really a product of what had come out of the British Radio Research Board, uh, Watts and Watts role there. So uh, the Radio Research Board in England, of course, I mean, as you can see, as well as Australia, they, they played key roles in the um, in the outcome of the war. Uh, these shots here, the, 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 the navigation shot is, is, um, is, the, is from a, a, a Boeing one showing the, um, the bearings which uh, a, 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 the Boeing 314 travelling across from um, Honolulu to, to New Zealand uh, had, had, a, had several stops but they the, the bearings, I think, which um, my grandfather was on, he, was, he, he got a Boeing 314 out of Honolulu on, on December the 4th. It was the last plane going to New Zealand out of um, Honolulu before the Pearl Harbor attack. And he, was in the, he was in the Boeing um, on the last leg going to New Zealand when the message came over the radio saying that the Japanese had attacked and the, um, uh, 
the plane continued on and it became quite famous because it, it could never return to America across the Pacific so it actually flew around the world and ended up getting back to, Amer to America via New York. But the, um, the, the map there is, just shows the bearings that the, um, the Boeing 314, I, think, I understand it, w could take to determine its position from um, uh, three, bear three locations to triangulate and um, work out where they were. In this case, they were, they were trying to get a bearing to, to arrive at Canton, but it seemed to work all right. They got there, and uh, but uh, in those days, I suppose you'd take your life into your, ha your hands if you um, if the radio didn't work, navigation didn't work correctly, but. In the top corner there, there's, that's a photo of the radiophysics laboratory in, um, during the war. It became quite crowded. They did extend the original building once and then they had to move the magnetron work down to, to Melbourne to make space and the magnetron work was done in the physics laboratory down in Melbourne. In the bottom is the, uh, the AWA teleradio. That was a vital piece of equipment for coast watchers. There was something like 20 coast watchers spread around the... Uh, uh, you had a, uh, uh, round from um, Guadalcanal to New to to uh, New Guinea and um, and East Coast Australia to sort of monitor all the uh, the details you know that the coast watchers you know could broadcast so um, that was a, a vital piece of equipment which it supplies. AWA did a lot of production work of radio equipment for the Allies during the war. Um, but that one was, uh, had a key role in the, um, in the defense of uh, Guadalcanal in the early stages. Because they could, the Coast Watchers were picking up, you know, the, the Japanese f planes flying down from Rabaul down to down to um, down to Guadalcanal. Solomon. Yeah, the Solomons. Yeah. So after the war, the uh, in one of the areas which uh, radio physics got involved with, especially through Joe Pawsey, was in radio astronomy. The in the uh, the seventy fifth anniversary was last October of, of where Joe Pawsey had gone to D Y and he earlier to sunrise there he had the idea that he'd use the um, the 1.5 meter or 200 megacycle antenna to to try and pick up radio waves, see what he could get coming out of the um, out of the sun, and he did he did get uh, get a response, and um, he was he was quite pleased about that, and uh, so anyway he he started to get involved in this whole area of radio astronomy, and and managed to take along with him uh, a lot of his uh, his. Um, Comrades, I suppose you'd call them, or fellow workers at the the laboratory. And uh, in this case, there are two young ones, uh, Gordon St Gordon Stanley and and John Bolton, and they're working out at Dover Heights there. So John Bolton later will appear. He he was he became a very significant figure in, in the Parkes Telescope in running Parks and was was actually driving the uh, the Parkes Telescope for the uh, the um, the moon landing mission. The uh, the four Yagi on on a trailer there. It was used at um, uh, at West Head. They they took it up to West Head to do try see what would happen if they got a sunrise there. And and they were looking for details. And they they actually took that uh, trailer over to New Zealand and made some observations there, which were which were quite useful for their early work in um, radio astronomy. In 1952, the, a key feature of the Ursi meeting, which I mentioned right at the beginning, was being planned, was uh, was the 21 centimetre hydrogen line. The, the 21 centimetre was originally proposed in uh, theoretically in from Holland around 1944, and the Dutch uh, had worked on it in, in, in early early 1952 using a um, a German uh, Würzburg uh, radar set. Actually, were able to detect um, radio waves. Um, at the 21 centimetre wavelength, you know, coming from hydrogen in the um, well, in, in the stratosphere, I suppose. It is, I'm not too sure how far out that they're expecting to get it, but they they did pick up radio waves, and it was uh, quite a significant thing. The 
the Americans, two Americans, uh, were able to confirm it as well. And, and uh, Chris Christensen here at the Radio Physics, he also got a telegram asking, could he check it? And um, in fairly quick time, he, he also was able to um, confirm that the uh, what the Dutch had, had proposed. And, and today, that uh, the, the 21 centimetre hydrogen line today, with all these big radio uh, telescopes, um, the ones that are being built in um, Western Australia, a great deal of the work that they're looking for is to, is to track down uh, radio waves from the uh, at 21 centimetres. Uh, the picture on the... Uh, the there are dishes there at Potts Hill, which was Chris Trishan's, and he, he, um, he's shown on the left there, and Jim Hindman, and then Fred White, uh, and Balthazar van der Poel, and Edward Appleton. They, they just they visited the Potts Hill site there and were discussing the situation. At the dinner uh, the, for the Ursi um, meeting, there's Fred White, my grandfather, and Ed, Edward Appleton. And also at Potts Hill, they had a 16 by 18 foot parabola, which was a very versatile piece of antenna and gear as well. So that was that was on show. In um, in the left there, there's a group from uh, Ersey where the there are representatives from Holland, America, and and uh, the Australian groups, the, the those involved with the 21 centima, centimeter, they 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 form they put a, a picture group there together. And in the middle is the um, is the the Wurzburg, the German Wurzburg, which the Dutch used to uh, for their radio astronomy and actually de detected the um, 21 centimeters. And the Germans themselves never used any of their own Würzburg for radio astronomy at all. They, um, they were in pretty poor shape after the war, but in 19, <coughs> 1955 they built their first, um, their first uh, radio astronomy antenna, which actually was a combined radar and radio, radio astro and telescope. And, uh, it was built by Mann from the, from Munich, and uh, and Mann went on to actually build the the Parkes telescope as well. So, one thing that <coughs> my grandfather got involved with with, with the radio physics after the war was the uh, CIRAC um, computer, which was built in 1950. He he uh, he recommended the funding of the project, which I think helped get it off the ground. And uh, and in by 19, in in early 19 in uh, I think it was um, July or June, or anyway, in 1950, uh, when the the CIRAC was, um, it, it was one of the very first digital computers. It, I think it was number three or number four in the world, and it had an enormous number of valves. You can see that, so you can see the outlay of the valves there. And it wasn't particularly powerful. In a few years' time, you could get a handheld calculator, which would be more powerful than than all this. But the um, Anyway, it was an achievement, and, and uh, there was a conference in which he chaired, and, and um, uh, David Myers, he was at, from Sydney University, he was he <coughs> he put a, he he put up um, a, details about analog type computers, and um, and the CSI or the radio physics, you know, presented the uh, the CIRAC. It it ran for quite a few years in Sydney, then was moved down to Melbourne, and uh, but no further work was done on on uh, computer work. The, the IBM and in America, a lot of people moving into it, and the the transistor was uh, there were rapid changes going on with with um, electronics and especially the, the, even though radio physics did get into um, uh, making their own making transistors as well. It didn't. Uh, that was only for a few years, and then um, AWA were into it, and um, so uh, radio physics basically just bought, bought their computers from then on for what they needed. Um, with radio astronomy, there's the narrow Bryce set up there from 1988, the Parkes telescope in the middle from 1961, and the the control desk at, uh, for the moon landing shown there. Taffy Bowen is involved there with John Bolton uh, driving the uh, the telescope. Um, so my grandfather was. The, the, these are just leg these are legacy type uh, radio astronomy. Is is so he wasn't he wasn't um, 
involved, I mean, the people to be who, who were involved had come through the radio research, but, but he, he hadn't be, been involved with radio astronomy as such himself. So the, the, it certainly is interesting to look at where things have moved on to from that. But um, uh, <clears throat> these, a couple more radio physics shots. Um, Bob Freider was running the, uh, the, uh, the telescope for uh, a narrow by there for uh, the Voyager missions. The, the Voyager missions, of, they did two of them, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 started out in, um, in uh, around July, August of 1977 and uh, they're still going now, almost 44 years later, the, uh, they're still sending radio signals back to Canberra for the de at the deep space station there. The, the power is, it was a um, it was a, well, a nuclear battery, an atomic battery, really, which is a kilo, I think, of, uh, of atomic material, which is driving the uh, the, ba the the ele producing the electricity to to power the transmitter, which is quite remarkable, really. I think I think Rutherford would be pretty happy to see that some of his if his work going in <laughs> to do that. Uh, with the Wi-Fi there, the, that's the team from the Wi-Fi group. Uh, John Sullivan is with a tie on. He led the group there, and um, uh, just as a, and, and John Sullivan, of course, is a uh, he's from Sydney University. He has a double degree in, in science and engineering as well, and a PhD. So that's very much in the line of the the type of training that uh, my grandfather you know, promoted at, at Sydney University, and. Um, there is one, I must point this out, the chap with the beard, that's John Dean. He's actually my second cousin. We, we didn't realise this until a few years ago, but his maternal grandfather is, in fact, um, uh, a brother of my uh, grandmother, Maud Molesworth. But he, um, he passed away last year, unfortunately, so we never really got together to, to compare notes. And in the bottom is there's the Interscan uh, landing system, which was developed by uh, Paul Wild. He he was uh, he was heavily involved there. But the uh, the GPS came along fairly soon after. So even though it was a good system, it it uh, it it didn't uh, it was super yeah. And finally, now we, uh, there's the shots there, the two shots, the, the, with radar after the war, the CSIRO got out of uh, defence work altogether and so the radio, radar work was set up in a government, government body and uh, defence science organisation. But Jen Lee is an over the horizon type radar which um, um, uh, is involved with uh, a number of different locations in Queensland, Central Australia and Western Australia there, but the, um, the Chinese are into it over the horizon radar and the Russians are into it too, so you'd, uh, I think they, those people know how this, this works and what, if they wanted to, I think they could jam it actually. But the, there are techniques, um, well, thing, I really don't know, um, <clears throat> where things have currently got to, but the um, the other aspect on, on this on the, is the other photo is um, is from Murchison in, in Western Australia. This is the the uh, the the, uh, the Australia Square Kilometre Array. Yeah, so that's still underway, and there's a huge computer. It involves huge computer power. The, the whole processing and vast quantities of data and uh, the headquarters of the, uh, the, the square kilometre array involves South Africa and, and the headquarters is back in Jodrell Bank in England and uh, there are a number of countries which are involved so um, it's very much a, a joint effort all around which it, it, radio astronomy was like that if right from the beginning of countries cooperating and people, people uh, contributing and um, there's certainly very good arrangements for sharing of time and all, and all this sort of thing. And uh, uh, <coughs> but Australia does seem to be doing quite well with it. But the uh, uh, it's a very it's very expensive. And um, as I say, the, there's huge amount of computer power involved. So I think I think that's just about near the end of it. But um, yes, that's it. So, the, anyway, I've got a, a book. Uh, 
Um, I think what we'll do is we take a couple of quick questions off the floor, and then if there's any of the Zoom uh, participants who want to ask any questions, we might get Phil to try and uh, work that out. So is there any questions on the floor that you'd like to put the Roger? It's a very interesting lecture, Roger. Very yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting we've had for a while. Are there any questions for Roger from the floor? Any at all? Well, Philip, if you can possibly ask some of the Zoom members whether they brought to, uh, to just ask any questions. That. All right. Yeah, do we have any questions from the, um, from the Zoom call? <laughs> They're all looking. <laughs> Roger, you did such a great job, you've got no <coughs> questions. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah. Their hands up if they can't hear you. Yeah. Well, well, I have a quick question, um, Roger. Um, so, so my understanding is that um, Sir John was also into fishing, is that true? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's a very good beach fisherman. He's probably one of the best. He used to go to Borley Point down the south coast and, uh, and he, he loved his whiting and his flathead. And uh, yeah, no, he'd just put on his old gear and uh, He'd make up all his lead sinkers in his workshop and check his gear out before he'd go down. I, I used to sleep on the back veranda and he had a trunk there and he, he could always smell the old salt, the salt air from his fishing gear. And, uh, but he'd check his, um, his fishing lines and he did try to show me how to cast one time. It's a bit of a tricky business without sort of messing up the line. But uh, no, he, he was a good fisherman. He made, he made us a couple of fishing rides out of old whip aerials so you got from the sub from uh, I don't know where Parramatta Road or somewhere, but anyway, he uh, he was a good fisherman. I, I think we also forget uh, <coughs> talking about um, your grandfather being a pioneer in uh, uh, um, basically propagation and, and the heap side layers and the layers of the ionosphere. We do forget how primitive it was when radio first started and how little knowledge they actually had of those layers. Oh yeah, they're starting from absolute scratch. So they're starting, starting from absolute scratch, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, well look, thank you very much. I think we'll end it there. If there's no other questions from anybody at all, I think we'll end it there. And uh, all, all I can say is, uh, I'll give you a quick, uh, this is our traditional uh, method of thanks. I'll give that to you to fill up. I'd just like to present that to you. Thank you very much. Oh, okay.